In times like these, we need faith that's victorious, and you can walk in it. Welcome to Victorious Faith with Pastor Mark Cowart. Hello and welcome to the broadcast. It is good to be with you. We're going to be continuing our series entitled Running the Race of Faith. Uh, last week, we started that out and there's some powerful nuggets. You're going to learn some, I believe, some really powerful stuff today. Um, one of the things, be sure to take advantage. Our free offer is the study notes to this series. Um, you can download those. The information's on the screen in front of you. And then also at the end of the broadcast, stay tuned all the way to the end. We'd love to be able to pray for you. And we've got people standing by to pray with you right now. And so uh, we're going to start right out. And I'm going to go a little bit different angle today. We're going to go 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And so we're talking about running the race of faith. And here's what we learned, these five things. Number one, we're a surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and we need to lay aside every weight because of that. What does that mean? I never really thought about it until this series of study. Basically what it is, I started thinking of the price that was paid from first off starting with the Lord on the cross, which is incomprehensible. Secondly, um, the early church, most of them, many of them, and then many will never know about till we get into eternity, paid with their lives this gospel uh, to allow the gospel to come into our hands. And ultimately, we have what we call the scriptures, Holy Bible. And then uh, as we go on down through the centuries, so many people, you think of Martin Luther, the Reformation, you study these things and all of a sudden you see if they hadn't been obedient, if they hadn't <clears throat> took what God gave them and ran with it, we, we wouldn't be here right now like we are. But then you come up to America and America is this 4% of the population, the most powerful nation ever. It has been America, the United States, with all of the rhetoric and all of the hatred spewed over this country. Um, We've been the cradle of the gospel, and we've sent more missionaries than anybody. And there's so much rich history, but the church went to sleep. The enemy came in, so tears. And now we're dealing with what we're dealing with. But because of that, he said, because of the great cloud of witnesses, our loved ones that have gone before us, nobody's here of our own accord. Somebody prayed for us. Somebody labored in the gospel for us. Some, whether we know it or not, things don't just happen accidentally. Somebody had to be obedient. And think about it. We stand on the shoulders of great men and women of God. We didn't get here by ourselves. So in light of that, he said, lay aside every weight, the sin which does so easily beset us. Number two, must have endurance. You cannot finish a race without endurance. We learned that you don't get a prize for entering the race. You get the prize when you finish the race. Number three, we must look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our, of our faith. And that actually talks about really meditate, study, contemplate the impact of that. And you do that through the word. Number four count your blessings and that is so powerful there will be a shift inside of you when you become more conscious of the blessings in your life than what you don't have there is a real danger to discontent that the scripture actually warns about number five do not despise the chastening of the lord um, have we even heard that taught in the body of christ God does deal with us, and uh, it says don't despise it, number one, but then don't faint when the Lord rebukes you. And actually, the Lord is dealing with this nation right now. So there's some things that we're going to get into this week. They're going to be so powerful. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19. This is a little bit different and something that I think will take most people by surprise, and it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it has to do with the fact of division in the body of Christ. It says, but of course, there, Paul said to the church at Corinth, but of course there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. You hearing what Paul's saying? There must be division. 
Now, I've been pastoring, senior pastor, for over 36 years now, just past that mark in January. And that's the last thing I, I wanted to see <laughs> was division. And then I learned a hard lesson that we are not called to be peace keepers, but peacemakers. What's the difference? Well, a peacekeeper is like just trying to get everybody to get along. Please, can we all just get along? And so, you know, even though this person over here has got a bad attitude and they need to align themselves with the word, they don't get confronted because the thought is, if I don't confront them, maybe they'll just calm down. Maybe the peace will come back in here. And that is not what we are called to be. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And listen to this. Sometime you have to declare war to make peace. What does that mean? You have to get everybody in the room and everybody's going to be upset. And, and this is the, the approach you have to take. It's the Word of God. Jesus is our cornerstone. Now, you know, cornerstones back in the day, they would line the whole building up off of the chief cornerstone. So Jesus is our chief cornerstone. We line up with Him, not with our denominational headquarters, not with the cultural trends of the day. We line up with Him. And that's what a peacemaker does. He brings the Lord Jesus, in other words, the Word of God, and He goes, this is what we're going to do. We're going to line up with the Word, no matter who likes it or who doesn't. Well, Paul was saying, of course, there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. Listen to this out of the Amplified. It says, for doubtless there have to be factions among you so that those who are of approved character may be clearly recognized among you. So basically there are people that need to grow up into him in all things and it will begin to separate who's really going to walk with the Lord and, um, and build the king, build and advance the kingdom or try to do their own thing. That's the difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Peacekeeping will wear you out. Peacemaker is what can bring ultimate peace and stability. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, some of you have heard me share about these five words the Lord gave me on February 6, 2020. That was about a month and a little bit like a week prior to Corona virus debacle breaking out and I was at my desk at home it was a Thursday February 6 2020 was a Thursday and I wasn't feeling particularly spiritual I just prepared something to share with the staff and I usually Linda and I we come into the staff meetings once a month it's one of our favorite times and um, so we're there we'll bring everybody together from both campuses we'll have a little breakfast recognize uh, birthdays and anniversary work dates and all those kind of things. And I'm getting ready to pack up my computer from the house and come in and all of a sudden the Lord just drops these five words into my heart and I pull a little post-it note out and I write them down and they meant absolutely nothing to me. And so they are this, five words, change, upheaval, shifting, redirecting, and increase. Very simple, change, upheaval, shifting, redirecting, and increase. And it was totally a surprise to me. And then as I look back in hindsight, the Lord saw what was coming with Corona. And I realized this is gonna be, now that I look back, I didn't see it at the time. Now I look and I go, this was gonna cause division. It began to cause a sifting. And the Lord spoke and revealed basically what he was doing during that was sifting, refining the body of Christ, and uh, there was shifting going on. Sifting, refining, and separation. And the Lord showed me there's a separation that's going on between the sheep and goats. There are tares in the body of Christ that identify that they're part of the body of Christ and they're not. It's like the tares and the wheat. They look identical, but then as you get closer to harvest, you start seeing signs they are totally different. I grew up on the farm. Now, 
when tares and wheat grow together, you really can't tell the difference when they're young, but then they get older. This is very interesting. I did a study on this a while back. They actually, the tares, there's a, one of the official names, it's kind of a fancy name, I can't even pronounce it. And, but there's also a name, it's called bastard wheat, bastard wheat. And you can actually make beer with it. And as I was reading on it, it's intoxicating. But if you have too much of it, it'll be fatal. So I thought, now that's really interesting that, um, you know, oh, one other thing about the tares, when it gets closer to harvest, that's when you begin to see the differences. Tares will stand straight up, but wheat will begin to bow over. Like the, the head of wheat, there'll be a little white tinge. And that's what Jesus said. He, he looked upon all the people. He said, pray the Lord of the harvest will send laborers, thrusting them out in the fields of harvest. He said the fields are white already unto harvest. And when that wheat gets a little tinge of white on it, you better get it out of the field or it's going to be lost soon. I believe that's where we're at right now. But it's interesting because those five words, change, upheaval, shifting, redirecting, and increase, the word shifting has really begun to stand out to me. The Lord let me know there's no expiration date on these words at the season that we're in right now. You know, basically, I was hoping... Okay, uh, we've been through change. Check that one off. Been through the upheaval. Sure enough, check that one off. Shifting, seen a lot of that. Redirecting, seen a lot of that. Increase, let's stay on that one, Lord. And what the Lord has revealed to me is there's no expiration date. We are in the end of the age, according to what I can see, and I believe that we are getting ready to, to we've, we've come to the last of the last days. And, you know, you can study these dispensations and nobody knows the exact hour when the Lord's returning. Jesus said that. There are certain things the Lord, the Father, has said in His own power, certain times and seasons. There are things, and that's the Greek word chronos and kairos, there are things that God has, has, has lined out that are going to happen within His time frame. And we know that there's a 6,000 year period of the Lord dealing with mankind. And then there'll be a thousand year millennial reign of Christ. Nobody knows when that's going to happen. I personally believe in the rapture of the church. The Lord's going to catch us away before uh, Daniel's 70th week. It's called Jacob's Trouble. It's going to be a time according to what Jesus said. There will be tribulation on this earth such as never been in the history of mankind or ever will be again. Now, if you know anything about history, if you read some of Fox's Book of Martyrs testimonies, you find out how Christians were sawn in half and how they were skinned alive and fed to lions and and uh, just, we could go on and on. Very gruesome things. Jesus said, what's coming during that period is going to exceed anything that's ever hit this planet, and it never will be again. So I do believe the Lord promised that we will be raptured out of here. We'll be caught away. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but the indication is He's going to be a great catching away. Jesus does not come back to earth at the rapture. He meets us in the air. And the scripture says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Ah, that just gives such a great witness in my spirit, how good the Lord is that he'll spare us from that. And one of the things during the tribulation, uh, Jesus also said, except those days be short and no flesh would be spared. There was a term that we came up with, uh, mutually assured destruction with the nuclear warheads around the world. It's, you know, mad. We're mad. Mankind is mad. If you leave mankind to themselves, they'll ultimately destroy. But during that, during that period, uh, if my understanding at this point, I may have to correct this later, but somewhere near three quarters of the human population left on the earth after the rapture of the church 
will die. It's just phenomenal. It's, it's going to be Satan's heyday. It's going to be his time to have control what he originally tried to do in overthrowing God, which must be what the Bible refers to as the mystery of iniquity. You know, it's difficult to even wrap your mind around something like that. So, but let's get back to this. So there has to be divisions. Why does there have to be divisions? Because as a pastor, there were times I didn't want division. You know, the word says we're all to get along together, to submit to one another and, and honor one another, walk in humility. Well, sometimes there has to be this upheaval in order to get to that place. And the key was in that Amplified Bible reading there where it said, Doubtless there have to be factions among you so that those who are of approved character. Uh, character is what a person is in secret. Character is how a person acts when they've been wrong. They can put a smile on and they can say everything's okay, but what really is going on on the inside? And that's a lot of this that we learn in the running the race of faith. The whole purpose of of, of walking in determination to follow after the Lord, to stay in the race, uh, to persevere, is so that the character of Christ is developing in you all along the way. You know, a lot of people pay attention to the happenings without. The Lord wants us to pay attention to the happenings within. The Lord taught me this years ago, going through all this upheaval when Lynn and I first became senior pastors. It was just like one thing after the other. People praying, trying to pray us out, um, praying the church would shut down, division, hurt, wounds, all those kinds of things. And I'm like, Lord, are we ever going to get any rest from all this? And here's what the Lord said. Over time, He spoke this to me. He said, Mark, the same sunshine that melts butter will harden clay. He said, regarding your heart, how you respond to what's going on will either harden your heart toward me or soften it toward me. And if I allow my heart to be softened toward the Lord, then I can harden my heart toward the devil. And what's interesting is the devil drags people around and they start blaming God. Why did you let this happen, Lord? And all the while, the Lord's wanting us to see the authority that He's given us. So, um, I wrote this in my book, Army of God Rising, Igniting Passion to Engage Society and Shift Culture. And that all fits of what my whole life message is about, the things that the Lord's shown me, the things the Lord has taught me about cultures, climates, and atmospheres. Really powerful how the Lord started that many years ago in my life. But here's an excerpt from my book, Army of God Rising. Divisions are necessary in the body of Christ, according to the Apostle Paul. As the coronavirus debacle unfolded, I witnessed the Lord working in a tremendous way. Then I understood the reason He gave me those five words on February 6, 2020. He was letting me know that He was with us and bringing about a much bigger plan, His plan. That was page 157 if you had the hard copy. Then I went on to say, first he revealed the body of Christ was and is not doing as well as we thought we were in America. Something like the lukewarm church in Laodicea. That's page 158. Do you remember the church in Laodicea? They were the lukewarm church. There were seven churches. Ephesus, it's kind of like bookends between Ephesus and and Laodicea. So Ephesus, they were, they were working hard. They were laboring, and Jesus commended them for all that they were doing right. There were some good things they were doing, good qualities, but he said, I got this against you. He said, you've left your first love. That is powerful. What do we really love? I, you know, you see people that get caught up in the blessing caught up in the world. And the Word tells us, 1 John particularly, that friendship with the world is really not good with God. Friendship with the world, loving the world, is like committing adultery on God the Father. Now, 
That's serious stuff. Just loving the world. You know, if I could just get on my soapbox a minute, sometimes I see, I'll hear about a preacher that's got a great ministry and, and good word and all that. So I'll look them up. And there are times that I have, I wanted to hear what they had to say. I'm always loving to hear what the Lord is showing other people. And I remember one guy in particular, so I went on and I listened to him and I couldn't hear what he was saying because I was so distracted by what he was wearing. <laughs> I mean, it's exaggerated. Is there anything wrong with having nice clothes? And all? No, there's nothing wrong with it. But I think most people know when stuff stands out where, you know, you get these guys are more excited about their $4,000 tennis shoes than they are about somebody coming to know the Lord or advancing the kingdom. Now, that may be a petty thing and maybe I have the problem. But I will tell you this, we have to really back up and look at the people we're with, we're partnering with. Are they ministry builders or are they kingdom advancers? There's been so much ministry building in America. That's why we're in the shape we're in. We got in and we used metrics that I talk about in the book that have nothing to do with discipleship. George Barna, they did the research. How to, they went to all the 384,000 churches, which has changed since Corona. And they, they found out what are the metrics that are used to say that you can back up and go, we're successful. And it's attendance, the budget, the number of square footage in the building, the number of staff, and number of programs offered. And, you know, God is not opposed to numbers. He wrote a book <laughs> called Numbers. Uh, you know, it is true. You should count people because people count. Um, and we could go on and on about that. But Jesus said, go make disciples. And I wonder how many Christians in America are ready to go to the death for the gospel. In other words, like some of our friends in India that we lose pastors every single year. They are literally brought to the point to renounce the gospel and convert back to Hinduism or they die. I can't even count how many pastors we've lost. We support two extremely powerful ministries. Modern day sign, one of them is a modern day sign and wonder. They are truly making disciples. <clears throat> They're growing several thousand churches a year, but each of the people, before you can be in the church, there has to be fruit of your life that you are a disciple. And when I see those kinds of things compared to America, um, you know, I tell you, we had so much separation and division <clears throat> during Corona. I had people mad at me because we closed at all the church. I had people mad because we didn't close the church, listen to what the governor said, and you know we go through all that stuff. But the bottom line, all of that was causing all this division. And guess what? It's probably the best thing that's happened to the body of Christ in a long time. During that time, we increased, we saw things, we went to a whole nother level and we've never looked back since then. We've grown, uh, increased, and all of that. But more important than all those metrics, that we talk about in the natural is spiritually where we are. And so there's a couple things I want to get into tomorrow. Um, but the bottom line is this, that 1 Corinthians 11, 19, all this stuff was going on in the church at Corinth, which was quite a carnal church. Paul said there has to be divisions. Why? So those of you who are of approved character, God's more interested in our character than He is our comfort. And there's a lot of things that happened since March 15th, 2020. That was the date for me. March 15th, 2020, I pulled up to the church. It was a surreal drive to the church. Everybody was home. Uh, we had set up a studio in our basement so that if we had to broadcast from them, we didn't know what was going to happen. You remember, there's going to be millions in the street if we don't, you know, stay home and let's flatten the curve. And then all of a sudden we're looking back and going, wow, this is really, this was very deceptive what happened to us. 
But what it allowed to happen is those that had the approval of God, those that had approved character, those that were going to follow after God and not after man, fear God and not fear man. So we'll, we'll stop right there. I'm going to pick up. There's some powerful things that I want to share. One is a quote. I'll leave you with this today. Pastor Adrian Rogers, who went on to be with the Lord some years ago, he said, men throw broken things away, but God never uses anything until he first breaks it. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. It's a powerful concept. So thanks for joining us today. A couple of things in closing. One, I want to pray for you. Number two, we would love to, if you need further prayer, we've got uh, prayer ministers standing by, but make sure to download our notes for this particular uh, uh, week of broadcast, for all of it actually, and uh, the information's on your screen. And let me pray for you now. I believe the Lord's spoken to some hearts today. Father, I thank you for the work that you are doing in every life. That, Lord, you're faithful. That you promised, gave us your word, that what you started in a person, you will perform it and complete it until the day of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for strengthening everyone under the sound of my voice. And I thank you for continuing to impart to them uh, anointing the strength of God within them, and you speak to them in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, we've got people standing by. The number's on your screen. If you'd like further prayer or ministry, please call. We're ready to pray with you right now. I just really sensed in my heart there's some folks that, you know, sometimes you, you get going along and maybe you came out of the race of faith God's not done with you. The call is still there. The purpose he has for you is still there. But you've got to forget those things that are behind and look and then what? Press forward, which means to forcefully advance into the things that God has ahead for you. So thanks for joining us today. I'll see you tomorrow at this same time. Till then, may the Lord's richest blessings be yours. For the joy that was set before him, Jesus ran his race and endured the cross. We too must set aside every weight and run our race of faith with endurance. Discover your path in this teaching, Running the Race of Faith. We're offering a free study guide as our gift to you, and the video and audio series of Running the Race of Faith are available for purchase on USB, DVD, CD, and MP3. Order this teaching today at markcowart.org or by calling 1-800-590-4764. Thank you so much for being a part of today's broadcast. Would you prayerfully consider partnering with us as we do the hard work of producing the Victorious Faith broadcast? When you give to this, it is going towards these messages going into people's homes and bringing transformation. Visit our website, markcowart.org, and become a partner today. Mark Cowart has been in ministry for over 40 years and is the senior pastor of Church for All Nations in Colorado Springs, Colorado, director of the Practical Government School at Karis Bible College in Woodland Park, Colorado, and a member of the board of directors of the Truth and Liberty Coalition.